We've got a pretty good crowd this morning for a holiday weekend. We're glad you're here. If you're, if you're a guest with us, we're especially glad that you came and shared your time with us this morning. Thank you for being here. We have folks watching us on the web. We stream our worship services. And we've got folks in Iowa, I think, and Alabama, and some of our members from here who can't be here are watching us on the web, and it's a good thing, a good technology tool that we have to be able to do that. So we greet you on the web, and we're glad you're you're tuning in this morning. Uh, Before we begin the lesson, I want to mention uh, there's some interest in a grief share ministry starting here. Uh, I'm looking to put together a a leadership team for that, but we need to know the level of interest that that may be here. Now, Grief Share is kind of a support group system of ministry that involves video lessons and group discussions and some journaling in uh, in workbooks. Uh, If you're interested in participating in in a thing like that, if you've lost a loved one and it's something that uh, would, would be helpful to you, would you let the office know, just give us a call at the office and let us know that you'd be interested. And if there's substantial interest for this, we will proceed on and, uh, and start this ministry. And it will be an ongoing ministry, I'm sure, as, uh, as there's always uh, folks losing loved ones. And, uh, and there's a need, I think, for that kind of support and encouragement. So let us know, and uh, we, will, uh, we, will, we will look into this further. So thank you again for your presence. We're, we're thinking this morning about our faith and how we walk with God in faith. I read a, 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 a quote that kind of caught my attention a few days ago. It's about a man named John Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh went to Calcutta, India a number of years ago on a quest for personal direction in his life. And he decided that he wanted to go to Calcutta and he wanted to work with Mother Teresa in the house of the dying and he was going to stay there three months. So when he met Mother Teresa, she asked him, what can I do for you? And he said, Mother Teresa, I need you to pray for clarity in my life. I need clarity. She said this, no, I will not do that. Clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. She went on to say, I have never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. Now that little story set me to thinking. I'm kind of like Kavanaugh. Most of my life when I pray to God, I pray that He would give me clarity and understanding about whatever it is I'm about to do. I rarely pray that God would help me trust Him more, but I want to have clear vision about what I'm supposed to do. But I think what Mother Teresa had to say was correct. I disagree with a lot of the theology that she might have, but I think have had, but I think she was uh, insightful into this concept of trust and trusting God. So as we think about our trust and our faith in God, we realize that our walking with God is not merely a formula for success in this world, but it is a journey that we travel on, and it is a journey of faith and trust. In the book of Hebrews, we're going to be looking Uh, in chapter 11 of Hebrews primarily this morning, and we're going to take a few little excursions a few other places. But the writer gives us a definition of faith in this text. Starting at verse 1, he says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of God of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that, we, that what was seen was not made out of things that were visible. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We're here today in our worship time, and the truth is, we're here out of a, an act of faith towards God. You don't see God's presence here, His glorious presence here. 
We believe He's here, and we believe that by faith, because we don't see the glory of God shining around us. But we believe He's here. It's one of those things that we take by faith. And then the writer goes on in verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Sometimes we read the Bible and we will say things like this. When I understand that scripture, I will try to practice it. In essence, we say to God, show me and I will believe. God says to us the exact opposite. God says, believe and I will show you. When the Hebrews came to Mount Sinai and God invited them to be His people, God was essentially proposing marriage to the nation of Israel. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. And in chapter 19, the people responded to God, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now that's in essence what that means. It's kind of a thought idea of the translation of that verse. But that's not what it literally says. It literally says, we shall do and we shall hear. We will do what you say and then we will understand. We will comprehend. We will get it. We will believe. And really, that's the way it works. God doesn't always give us clarity so that we understand everything that's going on, even in Scripture. We study and we study, and there are still things that we don't quite grasp. But God says, go ahead and obey me anyway. Naaman in 2 Kings 5 was the Syrian who had leprosy. He comes to the prophet Elisha in order to find out how he could be healed. Elisha doesn't even come out to greet this great warrior, but sends a servant out and tells him to go dip seven times in the Jordan River, and he would be cleansed. Remember the story. Remember how Naaman resists that. He looks at the muddy Jordan River, and there are places in Israel where the Jordan River flows out of the north, and it is a beautiful flowing river, Uh, clear water, really nice. But you get down into the desert, and that Jordan River becomes very murky and muddy, and, and today with some of the pollution that's down in that part of the river, they don't even want you going in the water, even though Glenn Davis did it when he was there. Stood in the water in the Jordan River, and that explains a lot about Glenn. But uh, anyway... Uh, But it's a dirty, in that part of Israel, it's a dirty river. And and Naaman comes to the edge of the river and he looks in and he says, I don't get it. We've got rivers back home that are better than these. Better than this. So why would I even go down into this murky, dirty river? Finally, his servants convince him to do it. And so he steps into the Jordan River. Dips one, two, all the way through exactly what the prophet had told him. And he comes out clean. His leprosy's gone. He didn't understand how it's all going to happen. But when he did what God said, it worked. He had his healing. He had his cleansing. And realized that the God of heaven was the true God. And even took dirt back home so he could remember his his experience with God. Notice Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And he goes on and he says, yes, we are of good courage. We would rather we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. Chapter 11 of Hebrews kind of expands on Paul's thinking here. That we are of good courage and that we walk by faith, 
not by sight. Hebrews 11, you'll remember, has a number of great heroes of faith listed in the chapter. And the writer gives us a little bit of the story for some of these people, but really emphasizes their faith and how their faith was so significant in how they lived before God. You will notice that as you read about the 11th chapter of Hebrews, it's sometimes called the faith chapter. It is sometimes called the great hall of faith, but it is never called the great chapter of understanding. It's never called the hall of understanding, that these people were smarter than everybody else, that they had more clarity than everybody else. No, this chapter is all about faith. It's all about that trust in God that you and I need today. And let me tell you something that's, I think, really important about this 11th chapter. When I read through that 11th chapter, I read about, we're going we're to look at three of those characters today. We're going to look at Noah and Abraham and Moses very quickly this morning. But read about them and some of the other people listed in that chapter. And I step back and I look at what spiritual giants they were. Abraham's the friend of God. Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. Noah saved the world by preparing an ark. What spiritual giants they were. And then I look at me and I think, oh, I don't measure up anywhere near those guys. But here's the good news. You and I may not be measuring up to that standard, that, that height of those uh, great men right now, but they weren't always that great. They were just like us. They started off and they learned and they grew and they developed in their faith and their trust in God and they became spiritual giants that we read about and so can you. You and I can be just like these men and women that are in the text and become giants of faith, but we have to commit to it. We have to make that a, a, a desire and an effort on our part. Well, let's look at these three very quickly this morning. The first of these is Noah. Notice what the writer says in chapter 11, verse 7 of Hebrews. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his house, his household, by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Here Noah had not seen what was coming. Uh, it's very possible there had never been rain in the world prior to the coming of, of the flood that came in the time of Noah. It's likely there was a dew that rose out and, and watered the ground and God didn't need to send rain. But he says to Noah, Oh, I'm going to flood, I'm going to send all this rain, and you need to prepare an ark for the saving of your family and all the animals that we're going to put on the ark. So Noah constructs the ark. That's a step of faith. He'd never seen that. And just like Noah, help, uh, faith helps us give in to the things of God when we don't see and we don't understand. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6 says. And that Noah walked with God. And then Moses lists the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and how everything unfolds. Noah gave to God, gave in to God, in what God had said to him. And he says in Genesis 7 that Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him to do. Did he understand it all? No, obviously not. He didn't. But he trusted God. He, he found favor with God. And he walked with God. We think about Enoch walking with God and others who walked with God, but Noah did too. And in that favor with God, it was based on faith in him. Now let's do a little quick application. There are things that Jesus teaches us that are not always crystal clear on how we ought to do them or why we should do them. And a lot of times when I read those kinds of verses, I want to step back and say, you know, when I figure this out, then I'm going to practice it. Jesus says, practice it first. Figure it out later. It's not always easy, and it's not always clear, and there are times that we just don't get it. But God says, do it anyway. For instance, in Luke 6, Jesus says, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. 
Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Now that's easy for for us to do, isn't it? And we understand everything Jesus was saying about that. And you know that's not true. You know that to love your enemy, it goes against the normal things that we do. The normal response to the enemy is, I'm going to get you, I'm going to take you down, I will get even with you, but Jesus said, don't do that. Love your enemy. Pray for the people that are abusive to you. He does the exact opposite, or leads us to do the exact opposite of what we want to do. On the cross, Jesus would say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He prays for his enemies, and he tells us to do that too. Here's the trick. When you're in that situation, faith says you do what Jesus says. Faith says you may not understand it. You may not see the reason for it. You may not see anything out of it, but do it anyway. It's a step of faith on your part. And there are numerous examples like that. How that Jesus tells us to do something, and it's really pretty simple. That's what he's telling us to do. And we simply need to do what he says. Abraham is another. While you think about giving in to the things of God as Noah did, we give up certain things as Abraham did. In Hebrews 11, starting at verse 8, the writer says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went in to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. This really is the the beginning of the, the walk with God, as Abraham gives up the familiar. God calls him to leave his family and his nation and to go to a land that he would be shown by God. How would you respond to that? Let's say God calls your name. And he said, I want you to get ready and I want you to go and I'm going to take you, I want to lead you to another place. What do you do? My response is, well, tell me where we're going so I'll know how to pack. And God says, no, I'm not going to tell you. You just come on, and I will take care of you. I will go on this journey with you. I will lead you and take care of you all along this path. And that's what Abraham did. He didn't know where he was going. He only knew that he was going. And Abraham is called to give up those familiar things like his place and his family to go to this new country. He's commanded later to give up his heir, to give up Isaac as he offers him to God. Remember that story, Genesis chapter 22. The writer talks about it this way. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham starts off, and he falters every so often in his walk with God. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 22, Abraham is willing to offer his one son, his special son, to God as God commanded him. Look at the journey Abraham makes in his faith. He lies about Sarah, She's his half-sister, and he lies about her so that he isn't killed by the king. And yet now he's willing to offer up his son. Isaac, by the way, is not a toddler at this point. It's estimated that he's about 30 to 40 years of age. Isaac had a lot of faith here, too. When they go up the mountain, Mount Moriah, in order to offer Isaac They have the wood and the fire, and remember, Isaac asks Abraham, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? God himself will provide, Abraham says, and he does. He stops Abraham from killing, offering Isaac, 
because that was a test of his faith. But what does the writer say? At this point in the life of Abraham, his faith was so developed and he was so close to God that he was able to say, to believe that God would even raise Isaac from the dead because God made a promise to him. A promise that Isaac would father others and that through those others there would be eventually a nation and a blessing to the whole world. So God uh, led Abraham to a place and God even tested him in his faith. Well, let's make an application. What's God calling you to give up? What's God calling you to offer to Him in the sacrifice of your life? We are living sacrifices, the Apostle Paul says, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. What's God calling you to give up? What's standing in your way in your relationship to God? Is there something blocking a full faith relationship with the Father? could be something to do with your time. could be something to do with the talents or abilities that you have. It could have something to do with the treasure that God has entrusted you with. Whatever it may be, there are times that we let things block us from our relationship with God, and God says, give it up. Give it up to me and serve me. And you remember in Deuteronomy, as Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, we are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. Not just compartmentalize a day of the week or a little bit of time here and there. It is 100%. So everything we do, whether it's our occupation, our hobby, or uh, family time, or whatever it may be, all of those things are dedicated to God, and we serve God in those things in one capacity or another. Is there something blocking your way? The last person, and we're just going to touch this for time's sake, is is Moses. Faith helps us give away things as Moses did. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh, or son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose to suffer affliction with people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a little while. Moses did that by faith. He stepped out and he went as God wanted him to do eventually. But, God, but Moses gave away in the story, gave away his position in Pharaoh's courts. He had an honored position and he even knew, according to Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, Moses knew that he was going to be the deliverer of his people. But he jumped ahead of God. He thought he had clarity, but he didn't have trust. And he jumped ahead of God and then eventually has to leave Egypt, flee into Midian where he is, he's he's waiting out his life. Remember he killed the uh, taskmaster and he was afraid he was going to be found out so he flees to Midian. Forty years he's a shepherd in the wilderness of Midian. He gave up his position and eventually he's going to give up his protection, his self-preservation Because he trusted in God. All the way through the plagues, the ten plagues, that God would, when God finally convinces Moses to to lead his people out of Egypt at the burning bush, Moses goes in and he confronts Pharaoh, and you remember the plagues that come. Now, all the way through those plagues, I'm not sure everybody understood completely what was going on. And especially in the death of the firstborn, the last plague. Moses is told that he's to tell the Hebrews that there's the Passover lamb that was to be killed and eaten by the Hebrews, and they were to take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorpost and the lintel of the house, and and the destroyer would uh, would not kill the firstborn in that house. Do you understand all that? On this side of it, I don't understand all of that. But Moses walked by faith, as did the Hebrews, and the blood of the lamb saved the firstborn in those houses. Moses no longer was protecting himself. He let God protect him. Well, we are imperfect and sometimes we don't wait on God. Sometimes we doubt God. Sometimes we're reluctant to serve God. But wonderful things happen 
when we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. Sometimes you might identify with me so many times that I've prayed and I've asked God to send that flaming arrow down from heaven and mark the path that I should take. And there's been occasions where God has very clearly shown me things that I've needed to do. But a lot of times it's not clear. A lot of times I make my prayers and it's not as direct as I would like to see. And I think God is saying to us in those times, when it's not clear. Just trust me. Just walk with me. Just believe that I'm there and that I'm taking care of you even when you can't see the end from the beginning. Just walk and trust. The writer ends chapter 11 and goes into 12 and he says, Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know who all is in the cloud of witnesses. I like to think that not only are the heroes of chapter 11 in that cloud. I like to think about others, all the others who have served God being in that cloud of witnesses. And I don't know what they can all see, but I kind of picture this great group of people watching us as we walk with God and as we try to live in this world, and that group is cheering us on. I don't know that they can have any interaction with us. I don't know that they can even really see us. But just picture that for a moment. You've got Moses and Abraham and Noah. and You've got Rahab and you've got uh, all these other greats that you read about in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. They're all there cheering us on. Others that you know that have passed on, they're in the cloud of witnesses cheering you on. And the walk is by faith. It's a faithful walk that you and I do because we trust in God and we hold fast to Him because of who He is. Let's stand and pray and then we'll have our invitation song. Our Father in heaven, we honor you as our God and as our Father. And today we recognize our need for faith. Father, would you increase our faith? Help us trust you more even when we don't see and we don't understand. Help us simply to walk where you want us to walk and to do what you want us to do. So many times we want to argue with you and complain to you or doubt you. Father, help us get over those things and to trust in you with all our hearts. You've done so much for us. You've made so many promises that have come true. Just help us trust you one more day at a time that we might uh, know you better and, and follow you more closely. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we offer the invitation of Jesus this morning in case anyone would like to respond. If you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, we encourage you to do that. If you need prayer for some reason, we would also encourage you. So we're going to sing together. And if you need to respond, come now.